it is not racist to note and to perceive the social existence of race. I should probably give trigger warnings before Ash Sarkar is going to appear on screen, but pretty much the whole video is going to be going through what Ash Sarkar is saying in her Navarra Media show that she does with Aaron Bastani. And they're both communists, and since they're both communists, neither one of them own a single brain cell that is capable of critical thought. Which is what makes videos like these so entertaining and so easy. But I agree with her. I don't think it's racist to point out that race is used as a social construct. But I can't imagine that I'm going to agree with her on much more than that. So let's go through what she has to say. Okay, we are not Labradors. We are not Dachshunds. We are not literally physically colorblind. And so what's racist is the perpetuation of a social order based on race. It's not observing that racism is a salient social factor. Can we just get that out of the way? Because that's the dumbest shit I've ever heard in my life. Okay, but no one's saying that we are physically colorblind. What people mean when they say they are colorblind is that a person's skin color does not come into their judgmental thought or any sort of thought when it comes to, say, hiring another person, judging another person, being friends with another person. I do it all the time and it's not that difficult. And sure, if there's a social order based on race, yes, I would agree that's racist. But I need examples of where that is happening because it's not happening in Britain. Well, generally, anyway. Racism takes different forms, but at its heart, race and racism are kind of indivisible, right? Race is a technology of governance. It's not the mere presence or deficiency of melanin. Right. Obviously, race and racism are indivisible. You need race to exist for racism to exist. So well done. And that second part, race is a technology of government, or governance as you say. Well, that's entirely reliant on what the government is actually doing, especially when it comes to race. For instance, recently, Academic Agent did a video on Liberia calling it the real Wakanda. Because, yes, race does matter when it comes to your citizenship there. But if you choose a country like, I don't know, the UK, your race doesn't come into whether you can be a citizen or not. All that matters is whether you were born here or you passed a citizenship test. And racism goes beyond the government as well, but hopefully you get into that. And it's something which gets invented at a particular point in history. It doesn't always exist. Well, that's bullshit. Race has always existed. Now, if you said instead that some governments give different rights and privileges to people based on race at different points in history, yeah, that'd be fine. But to say that race was invented by governments? Are you crazy? Like, race is literally to do with the amount of melanin in your skin. Or at least partly to do with that. It's basically entirely genetics. It's entirely biology. Biology wasn't invented by governments, for God's sake. And I would argue that the really key dates for thinking about when race gets invented really is between 1492 and the early 1600s. Oh, this is my shit, by the way. I love this yeah, shit. it's getting heavy. Your window for race getting invented is a hundred years, or just over a hundred years. Are you crazy? And not only that, it's during the Renaissance period in Europe. Like what, even the Bible, the Bible itself in ancient Egypt showed that racism was existing because the Jews were slaves. You know, this is going all the way back to the book of Exodus and the phrase, let my people go, there's a sort of implied group aspect to that that was probably racial. And that's not even getting into the Arab slave trade that has, by definition, been racist since the start of Arab civilization, which is some of the earliest civilizations we've had. Anyway, let's see your arguments for the Europeans being the racist ones. Between these two dates, you've got the development of this idea that culture and the taxonomy of the human that comes with culture is something which is hereditarily transmitted. Well, culture in a lot of ways is hereditary. How much of it is due to biology is still under debate generally. For instance, cultures that had to drink milk to get their vitamin D and calcium in them tended to become a lot less intolerant to lactose. It's why you see a lot of Northern European people not being incredibly lactose intolerant at all, and a lot of African people being very lactose intolerant. So culture can influence genes, and I don't see why genes can't influence culture as well. Anyway, Ash, carry on. So it's something which takes from the way in which anti-Semitism functions, particularly in the Iberian Peninsula, and you've got the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, and it applies it to what would become racial others. 
it's before the real dividing line in terms of you know the human and the not quite human is is whether you're Christian or, or not. Oh, that explains why she chose this time period. It's to have a go at the Christians. But as I said before, the Jews were slaves in Egypt. And generally, slaves were not exactly seen as human. I mean, they're slaves, of course they were. They were overwhelmingly Jewish. But no, because the Jews got expelled from Spain in the 1500s, no, nah, that's where racism started. That's the, that's the first place we see that. Jesus, Ash. And then in the early 1600s, you've got the expulsion of the Moriscos. And this is a really interesting thing um, because the Moriscos were Christian. So they were called the New Christians and they were the Christian descendants of the Moors who had uh, previously uh, ruled in Spain. Yes, they were invaders. Spain has gone through a lot of wars with the Moors and the Moors took over quite a lot of the south of Spain. But of course, you're going to ignore that and say, oh, it's because they were Moorish they were kicked out. Yeah, the Moors are from Morocco. They're not from Spain, so they were absolutely invading. Believe it or not, people tend to want to kick out invaders. But anyway, you're going to racialise this, so uh, let's see how you do it. And so that's the moment, right, which is actually quite a while after the Reconquista, the reconquest of Spain um, by uh, the Castilians, in which it's going, OK, no, 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 actually religion won't be the dividing line here. It's something else. It's this other thing and it's got a relationship to uh the sort of westwards expansion of the ottoman empire it's got a relationship to the colonization of the americas it's got a relationship to the beginnings of transatlantic slavery as well well that is pretty poor reasoning really ash you just admit that the ottomans and the moors yeah they were invaders they were invading and trying to make a massive empire then you're trying to say oh yeah this has just got a massive relationship to the transatlantic trade of slaves what? No, it doesn't. I'm happy to admit that the transatlantic slave trade was based on race, intentionally or not. I think it was more to do with the fact that chieftains of Africa had a lot of black people that they captured and then decided to sell as slaves. But to say that the Ottomans and the Moors, who were invading Spain and other areas, were being kicked out of those countries because of their race? That's just ignorant of all history in that area. They actually lived quite happily together quite fine for a while until... There was a massive clash in culture. For instance, there's a mosque in, I think, Cordoba. And in the middle of the mosque, there's actually a little chapel for Christians. Like, there was evidence that they were living quite happily together. So where does your theory on race go there? Oh, it falls apart because it turns out it's actually just to do with a massive culture clash and the fact that the Moors were invading. And she's honestly so sneaky trying to blame this all on race. Luckily, I went there for a school trip when I was younger, so I know quite a lot about the uh, Spanish history with the Moors, but... I mean, honestly, anyone who doesn't will just take a word for it. So race, racism doesn't always exist. And these two things are, are kind of inseparable. No, Ash, race does always exist. It's a biological phenomenon. And the genetics do go beyond skin colour. That's why, say, West Africans are good at sprinting and East Africans are good at long distance running. Because the way their genes work makes their muscles better for their respective sports. That's why white people tend to win all the swimming and black people tend to win all the running. Now, does that mean racism always exists? No. Just because people see race doesn't mean that they are racist. And just because the Moors are getting kicked out of Spain for conquering them doesn't mean the Spanish hated them because they were Moors. And then you've got the way in which race has a relationship with class. It has this material dimension. Oh, for the love of God. Uh, Fanon's work, and uh, Wretched of the Earth in particular, looks at the way in which race is, you know, a class hierarchy on a global scale. Ash, you need to read two books. You need to read Why Nations Fail, and you need to read G Guns, Germs and Steel. There's a lot of holes in your theory, and a lot of the things in those books answer them. Part of the reason Europe was so good with trade is the fact its latitude is not boiling hot, and the fact its rivers can be used for transport. It's also the fact that we have quite a lot of beasts of burden and good land for farming. Africa's missing quite a lot of all that, and that's why they didn't quite develop in the same way as we did. It's not because of a global conspiracy of racism. He talks about colonised peoples as, you know, the global... Uh, lumpen proletariat and then you've got racism as it shapes our day-to-day -day lived reality particularly in diaspora contexts so you know here or in france or in america and you can experience it through 
contact with institutions and the way in which institutions reproduce racialized outcomes. So you might think of the criminal justice system, you might think of the education system, you might think about housing. Well, in the education system, the worst person to be is a white working class boy. So I'm not too sure how your racial theory works in uh, the area of education. Uh, in America, you are more likely to be shot as a white man than a black man when you are stopped by the police. So again, not sure how your racial thing works there. But none of that matters, because she is basically saying that if outcomes aren't the way I want to see them, then it's racist. I mean, that's just such a terrible way of framing the whole situation. And it's a very communist way to do it, which isn't a surprise because she's a communist. But a liberal only cares about the process. Is the process racist? No. Therefore, it is not racist. I'm not saying every institution in the world's not racist. There could be processes that are racist. I mean, hell, look at the way that every single grooming gang has been treated in the UK. That is definitely racist, especially when the police told their underlings to search for different ethnicities that weren't Pakistani, etc. Because it was affecting racial outcomes. Well, I don't care about racial outcomes. They are irrelevant when it comes to dealing out justice. And Ash, you are perpetuating this bullshit. Please stop. And then there's also the interpersonal stuff. And the interpersonal stuff can be overt and it can be covert. And this is the really contested bit. Oh, this is the contested bit, is it, Ash? Because the rest of what you have just said is totally historically illiterate. No, the part where you accuse every single person of being racist. Yep, no, that's that's not the contested part. No, it's just this bit. All right, let's go then. Because how we tend to talk about racism in this country is that one, everything I've just said about history, institutions and class composition out the window. Well, that's only because you were wrong on every metric. Yes, out the window. And what we're going to talk about instead are those few instances where it's overt. Well, you need to go into your examples of what covert racism is, because it apparently just seems to be, oh, institutions have different races with different outcomes. It's not entirely proportional. It's like, well, yeah, that's not covert racism, and you can't actually have any tangible evidence that it is, apart from your outcomes. So then you just get into circular thinking. It's like saying elephants camouflage themselves throughout the UK, and then when I say, well, I haven't seen one, well, there you go. That just proves my point that elephants camouflage themselves and the proof is you can't see them. Like, doesn't doesn't make any sense. But that's the only logic you employ when trying to say there's covert racism. And yet, overt racism does exist. And it's actually tangibly provable with physical evidence. That's why people are okay with talking about the overt racism, as you call it. And I mean, for God's sake, when you're overtly racist against white people... That's overt racism and you just throw it out of the window because white people can't experience racism according to you. Which ironically, in and of itself, is actually a racist statement. But no, you just throw that out of the window. So I'm sorry, if you're having a go at people like me throwing your accusations of racism out the window with historical illiteracy, then I don't care what you actually think overt racism is. I have enough critical power in my brain to understand where racism exists and where it needs to be fought. And you are one of the examples of where racism needs to be fought. Anyway, carry on. So someone literally has to call you a slur. They've got to say the N-word. They've got to do it with a hard R. And they've got to do it in English. Because, mm. you know, otherwise you get the Luis Suarez cop out. We're like, in my country, it's just a term of endearment. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Is your only example of overt racism seriously just saying the N-word? Is it seriously just racial slurs? Maybe this is why people don't take you seriously, Ash. Because your only examples of overt racism are just nasty words. Like, no one's going to take you seriously then. It's like, oh, like, Luis Suarez said the N-word in his own language, and he was defending himself by saying that it's not a real, like, slur. Like, God, if that's the extent that overt racism gets to, maybe you are just making shit up. Because nasty words, all right, we shouldn't be saying it in polite society, whatever, but nobody cares about them. The place where it's mainly said, really, is in rap music, but nobody cares about it in that because every rapper's black who says it. And then it's in some Quentin Tarantino films, and that's in there for stylization. But it's actually very rare that you'll hear anyone on the streets saying the N-word. Very rare that you hear it in day-to-day -day life. I don't think I've actually ever heard it on the streets. So when you're saying, oh, avert racism's everywhere, you know, people get called the N-word all the time, so no one's going to take you seriously. I can't believe that's your only example. And then listen to what you go into after that. And you're not going to talk about all those covert things that happen. So all of those social cues which remind you 
that your humanity is not being recognized. And those social cues can be individual and they can be cumulative. So when we're talking about Meghan Markle, we're talking about the cumulative treatment. Oh God, you're seriously gonna use Meghan Markle as an example. I just want one example where someone was actually racist to her. Just one. Because all I hear is everyone saying to each other in this sort of echo chamber and ironically it accumulates to, yeah, people were racist to her. Yeah, yeah, the British tabloids were definitely racist to her. Hmm. Oh, what were they doing? Oh, they were just being a bit harsher to her than they were to Kate. Why are they doing that? Oh, probably because she's just in total contempt of her duties. She married into a royal family and doesn't care that she's part of a royal family and has duties to uphold. And then whenever she's up on stage... She's there to talk down to the common people. Yeah, believe it or not, people don't tend to like that. Does that make them racist? No. And you absolutely need good evidence to prove otherwise. And to say it's covert, as I said before, is to say that there are camouflaged elephants all over England. I actually need to see one. Otherwise, you can just keep saying that they exist. Of how the press has Mm. been presenting her... And then what that does to shape and dictate a national conversation about race in this country. You are a grifter, Ash. You are a race grifter. The only reason you are constantly put back on telly all the time is because you keep coming out with this bullshit to tell the common people that they're all racist. Why are they all racist? Because they don't like a royal who doesn't act like a royal. Like, no, I'm not accepting that. Anyway, you had another segment on this show that we need to go through, because again, you don't know what you're talking about. I I tend not to use the phrase white privilege. Sometimes you get lots of words and the word privilege will do. Whereas I think that it's, um, it's tautologous. So really whiteness as it is invented, and it's invented at a particular moment, is invented to institute a global system of wealth extraction and labor exploitation right that's what that's what it does oh my god i absolutely hate communist rhetoric i mean i don't know what the hell she means by whiteness is tautologous does she mean in in the way of it either exists or it doesn't or does she mean it in the way that it is a needlessly repeated idea and she says she doesn't use the word white privilege that's that's just bollocks she says it every time she's on tv but jesus christ whiteness is just the modern version of bourgeoisie yeah i tend to agree But just like Marxist theory, it doesn't really apply to the real world in any tangible way. Because as I said before, within education in the UK, white working class boys are failing. But she's just going to ignore that because it doesn't fit in with her worldview. And so I think that really when you talk about, you know, white privilege... I just, I, I, for me, it doesn't add anything to that historical understanding. I don't think your mind's in a good state when the only reason you're not using white privilege is because you think it muddles up historical context of your own version of history. Why not just not use it because it's an incredibly disingenuous way to view the world and an incredibly backhanded way to try and win an argument? Why can't you just say that? Oh, because you actually do believe it exists. You just think it doesn't exactly get white normies on board with what you're saying. When it comes to thinking about how people's lives are measurably different, it was useful, I think, for my boyfriend to see the difference between how he could expect to be treated when, you know, he was at a restaurant versus how I was being treated when we were on dates together. That was kind of, you know, not eye-opening in the sense of he's just like, I did not know any of this existed before. But he was like, no, it was actually kind of mm. startling. It sort of, you know, changed my view a bit of, of how you must see the world. Again, it's just that camouflaged em- elephant thing. Oh, my boyfriend saw that I was being treated differently. Well, I don't, you, you haven't given an example the guy just went in a restaurant, was like treated fine, and then went to a restaurant with you and was treated differently. But this sounds like one, two different restaurants, and two, I don't know, maybe your boyfriend's more polite than you? She don't seem like a very polite person, Ash. And for all we know, it could have nothing to do with the race. But again, you're just seeing these camouflaged elephants all over the UK and the world, and the rest of us are going, well, where the hell are they? And you're just saying, oh, it's covert. You can't see them. Well, that doesn't prove anything, Ash. This is what I mean. There is no tangible evidence that you are putting forward. And the stuff you are putting forward is completely wrong and illiterate. Um, And I don't really feel that the word privilege had to come into it because it was never about making him feel guilty Mm. for 
the life that he has lived because white guilt has no value to me it's got zero value well there you go that's why she doesn't use the words white privilege even though i've heard her use it loads she's trying to get the white normies on her side and she knows that saying that they have white privilege you know tell them that there's covert invisible elephants all over the uk yeah they're obviously not going to go on her side for something that they clearly can't see so she has to use historical inaccuracy instead to try and get people on her side which isn't going to work What I want at an interpersonal level is understanding, empathy and solidarity. And at a political level, I want the pursuit of redistributive goals, whether that's power, whether that's wealth, whether that's land, um, in order to pursue aims of social justice along class, gender and race lines. Yes, she wants fully automated luxury communism. Yes, we know that, Ash. And you appear to have realised that you are not going to get that when you berate people and call them white privileged or whatever. But there you go, I just wanted to do something quick and easy today because I have had flu for a week and I've been in my bed dying. But I'm feeling a lot better now, so that's all I had for today, so thank you very much for listening and until next time as usual, a goodbye.